When I was a boy, world was better spot. What was so was so. Uh, to me, it is the most moving piece of music in the whole play. Because it represents something that Oscar described very well. And, and, and I think everybody should hear it. Yul Brynner was one of the most charismatic and beloved actors in Hollywood history. However, decades after his untimely passing, his daughter has revealed nasty facts about his character. Known for his portrayal of King Mongkut in the renowned stage musical The King and I, Yul Brynner had charmed audiences from far and wide. However, these distasteful revelations have drastically harmed Brynner's untainted image. What repulsive things was Yul Brynner accused of? How did he impact his family and friends during his lifetime? Join us as we explore the much lesser known aspects of Yul Brynner's life and unravel the layers that have shaped his legacy. Behind the spotlight, Yul Brynner's charisma, conflict, and controversy. Yul Brynner, the iconic actor celebrated for his captivating performances, was not only known for his talent, but also infamous for his demanding and merciless nature. His portrayal of King Mong Kut in the 1956 film adaptation of The King and I earned him an Oscar for Best Actor. Yet the film remains banned in Thailand due to its unflattering depiction of the monarch, a characterization that some argue mirrored Brynner's own persona. Brynner's commitment to the role of King Monket was unparalleled. Having performed it an astounding 4,625 times on stage, he once admitted that the king took him over, suggesting a deep immersion into the character that may have spilled over into his personal life. Despite the success of this role, Brynner's filmography includes other celebrated works such as The Ten Commandments, The Magnificent Seven, and Westworld. However, Tales of Brynner's egotism and demanding behavior were as legendary as his performances. Bitter rivalries with fellow actors, including Steve McQueen and Ingrid Bergman, marked his career. Bergman, who won the Best Actress Oscar the same year Brynner won, shared stories of his churlish behavior on the set of Anastasia. What were the causes of these confrontations? Was Yul Brynner really at fault in every scenario? Let's delve into the truth about these accusations. Yul Brynner's encounter with Ingrid Bergman on the set of Anastasia showcased his notorious temper and height-related insecurities. Standing at 5 feet 6, 1, 2 inches, Brynner was over an inch shorter than the Swedish actress in flat feet. When Bergman, in a polite gesture, suggested using props to address the height difference, Brynner responded with a sharp retort refusing to play the scene on a box and asserting that he's going to show the world what a big horse she is. Despite this onset tension, Ingrid Bergman went on to win her own Oscar for the role in Anastasia. It marked her second Academy Award, out of the three she would eventually receive during her illustrious career. Bergman's success not only highlighted her acting prowess, but also demonstrated her ability to navigate challenging dynamics on set, including clashes with co-stars. Brynner's conflicts with Steve McQueen during The Magnificent Seven extended beyond on-screen dynamics as well. According to co-star Eli Wallach's autobiography, Brynner hired an assistant to count the number of times McQueen touched his hat, while Brynner was delivering lines highlighting the intensity of their rivalry. It all started because Brynner, known for his commanding presence and meticulous nature, would scuff the earth into low mounds when shooting outside, creating makeshift platforms for himself. In response, McQueen, with a casual nonchalance, would flatten these mounds as he walked past. The growing amusement and irritation between the two actors manifested in subtle tactics. McQueen seeking to pull focus and perhaps express his annoyance, played with his hat or belt whenever Brynner had a speaking scene. It became a silent battle for attention on the set. In reflecting on their strained relationship, McQueen openly admitted that they didn't get along. The tensions reached a point where Brynner confronted McQueen in front of a crowd, grabbing him by the shoulder in a display of anger. 
McQueen speculated that Brenner's discomfort might have stemmed from his lack of proficiency in horse riding and firearms, perceiving McQueen, who was at ease in these elements, as a potential threat. The Fascinating Events During Yule Brenner's childhood, Brenner's mysterious persona extended beyond his onset conflicts. He cultivated an air of mystery surrounding his origins, perpetuating various stories about his early life. Humorously, he claimed there are 10 or 12 stories in circulation about his early life. He also added confusion by providing conflicting information about his birth year. In a display of imperiousness, he declared that ordinary mortals need but one birthday. However, the truth eventually emerged. Brinner was born Yuli Borisovich Briner in Vladivostok on July 11, 1920, as confirmed on his tombstone. His life was woven with fantastical tales, and one of the most intriguing claims was his assertion of having fought for the International Brigade during the Spanish Civil War. This added yet another layer of complexity to the mysterious personality of the iconic actor. Brenner's early life was marked by turmoil and adventure, beginning with the abandonment of his family by his father Boris, a mining engineer. Raised in Beijing, Yule harbored bitterness towards his father. Amidst the escalating conflict between China and Japan in 1932, his mother, Marussia, made a daring move to relocate the family to Paris laying the foundation for Yule's life of diverse experiences. Leaving school at the age of 16, Brenner embarked on a journey showcasing his versatility and dramatic flair. Initially, he joined a traveling gypsy troupe playing the guitar and later transitioned into the world of acrobatics as a trapeze artist with the renowned Cirque d'Hiver. However, a fall from the parallel bars in 1937, resulting in 49 fractures, abruptly halted his circus career. As Brenner recuperated, his multilingual abilities, including fluency in English, French, Japanese, Hungarian, and some Russian, shifted his focus to the stage. This ambition prompted his move to America in 1940, marking the beginning of a decade-long period of struggle and perseverance. During this time, Brenner took on various roles, from driving a bus for an actor's company to playing small roles on Broadway. In 1941, he marked his entrance into the world of theater with a debut performance in Shakespeare's Twelfth Night on Broadway. The play premiered on December 2, 1941, with Brenner taking on the role of Fabian. During this portrayal, he delivered a few lines in broken English, showcasing a noticeable Russian accent. This experience not only added English to his linguistic repertoire, but also demonstrated his early versatility as a performer. However, the production faced an abrupt end, like many others on Broadway. Following the attack on Pearl Harbor and the subsequent declaration of war by the United States against Japan and Nazi Germany. In the aftermath of these historical events, Brenner adapted to the changing landscape by taking on a role as a radio commentator for the Voice of America radio station. In this capacity, he engaged in broadcasting war propaganda in both French and Russian, showcasing his multilingual abilities. The years that followed saw Brenner diversifying his professional pursuits, while he engaged in limited acting projects, such as co-starring with Mary Martin in 1946's The Lute Song, he also explored modeling, capturing attention through a nude photo shoot by George Platlines. Brenner's personal life underwent significant developments during this period, marked by his first marriage to actress Virginia Gilmore in 1944. Brenner's personal life added another layer of complexity, featuring a passionate affair with actor Herd Hatfield, known for his role in The Picture of Dorian Gray in 1945. Despite later having four marriages and numerous high-profile affairs with actresses like Marlene Dietrich, Judy Garland, and Joan Crawford, Brenner never publicly acknowledged his bisexuality. His male relationships, including one with poet and filmmaker Jean Cocteau, were discreetly kept out of the public eye. 
Yul Brynner in The King and I, the role that made him popular, the journey to becoming the iconic King Monket of Siam in The King and I was a tale of initial adversity and eventual triumph for Brynner. When he initially auditioned for the role in 1950, the production focused primarily on Gertrude Lawrence, who played Anna, the English governess to Monkut's children. Audiences initially reacted negatively, with one even throwing a shoe at him during a performance. Despite the rocky start, Brynner's captivating performances soon turned the tide. Though he was proud of his long locks, he made a bold move by shaving his head to fully embody the image of a Siamese monarch, adding authenticity to his portrayal. This decision not only generated significant publicity, but also became a deafening feature of his globally recognized image. After the release of the movie version of The King and I, in March 1952, Brynner won a Tony Award for Best Featured Actor in a Musical, solidifying his standing in the theatrical world. The turning point in Brynner's career came in August 1952, when Gertrude Lawrence passed away. Instead of grief, Brynner felt a realization that he would now receive top billing. The film version of The King and I propelled him to international fame, and his distinctive look became synonymous with the character. Charlton Heston praised Brynner's work, stating, Yule's work in The King and I was beyond compare. The journey from adversity to triumph defined Yule Brynner's legacy in the world of entertainment. Yule Brynner's newfound fame brought with it a set of quirks that added layers to his already complex persona. One notable quirk was his insistence on not being photographed next to any other hairless actors. Reports suggest that he instructed his press agent with a decree of no pictures with bald actors. This idiosyncratic demand highlighted Brynner's commanding presence both on and off the stage. Yul Brynner's toxic personality at the peak of narcissism. During the run of The King and I, Yul Brynner's offstage behavior became increasingly notorious. Frank Langella, who starred as Dracula at the same time at the Martin Beck Theater, provided a candid account of Brynner's demeanor in his 2012 memoir. Langella painted a portrait of Brynner as a man consumed by narcissism, perpetually close to a full-length mirror with the word I, featuring prominently in his conversations. Langella's revelations included disturbing aspects of Brynner's personality, such as racial prejudice, during a ride in Brynner's 20-foot-long white limousine, the actor demonstrated gadgets, including strobe lights. Shockingly, Brynner aimed the lights at Langella and his wife, claiming they were in case black individuals attacked his car, using the lights to scare them away. This revelation exposed Brynner's troubling racial biases. Langella further disclosed Brynner's demand for special treatment, including instructing the theater to build a special lift to accommodate his car, allowing him to avoid interacting with the public. Brynner often expressed disdain for his audiences, refusing to bow and presenting his backside instead. Stories circulated about Brynner's vicious remarks to production staff and threats to have people sacked. Despite or perhaps because of his demanding nature, Brynner took pride in his ruthless approach to the theater. He declared to television host Bill Boggs that he was merciless about things in the theater, the lazy ones should be afraid of him, and that any dead wood that he came across, he simply broke off. Despite his notorious temper, Brynner adamantly claimed that he did not need psychotherapy, stating, the day anyone stretches me out on a couch, I'll be either drunk or dead. This declaration encapsulated the unyielding and often erratic nature of Brynner's persona. During this tumultuous period in his career, Yul Brynner's son, known by the childhood nickname Rocky, openly acknowledged his father's challenging nature. He noted that Brynner could be difficult and went a little crazy at times. Rocky, who later worked as the road manager for the band Bob Dylan, and served as a bodyguard to Muhammad Ali, hinted at the complexities of growing up with the renowned actor. Ray Harryhausen, 
the special effects maestro who worked on The Magnificent Seven, described Brenner as a good actor but also as a man who was difficult and bad-tempered with his own set of demands. This sentiment was echoed by Brenner's agent, Robbie Lance, who revealed that the actor's contract demands were astonishingly meticulous. Brenner specified details such as the color of the carpet in his trailer, the type of tissues provided, and even the brand of bottled water in hotel suites. By the time Brenner took on the role of Captain Moeller in the 1965 film Morituri, starring alongside Marlon Brando, he had reached a level of influence where he could make extraordinary stipulations. Powerful enough to assert his preferences, Brenner insisted that a landing pad be constructed on the ship, enabling a private helicopter to take him ashore after each day's shoot. This extravagant demand underscored both the actor's commanding presence in the industry and his penchant for personalized and opulent arrangements. Despite earning what his agent Robbie Lance described as astronomical fees, Yul Brynner still garnered a reputation for being surprisingly frugal. Anecdotes from those who worked closely with him revealed this facet of his personality, showcasing the intricacies and contradictions within the mesmerizing actor's life. Shedding light on Yul Brynner's penchant for penny-pinching reveals a fascinating aspect of the iconic actor's personality. One account of this frugality comes from George Jacobs, a member of Frank Sinatra's staff. Jacobs, who got to know Brynner through their shared involvement in the 1966 thriller Cast a Giant Shadow and their mutual interest in golf, disclosed in his memoir Mr. S. The Last Word on Frank Sinatra that Brenner often relied on Sinatra for food, drinks, and socializing. In a humorous twist, Jacobs and his associates dubbed Brenner Uncle Scrooge, the king of the tight wads, highlighting Brenner's reputation for being economical despite his considerable wealth. How Yule Brenner grew numerous interests outside acting. Brenner's interests extended beyond acting, showcasing his versatility. He was also an accomplished photographer, capturing over 8,000 photographs featuring celebrities such as Elizabeth Taylor, Anthony Quinn, Sophia Loren, Mia Farrow, and Audrey Hepburn. Notably, Hepburn served as the godmother to Brenner's daughter, Victoria, born to his second wife, the Chilean model, Doris Kleiner. In 1996, Victoria compiled a collection of her father's photographic works for the coffee table book, Yule Brenner Photographer, providing a glimpse into Brenner's artistic pursuits and his ability to capture the essence of his famous peers through his lens. Expanding his ventures, Brenner ventured into the culinary world by authoring the Yule Brenner Cookbook, Food Fit for the King and You. This cookbook shared his personal recipes, including intriguing dishes like dandelion soup and pork and sauerkraut ragu, revealing another facet of Brenner's multifaceted personality and his willingness to explore and share aspects of his life beyond acting. In 1971, Brenner embarked on his third marriage with Jacqueline Thion de la Chaume, the fashion editor of French Vogue. This union marked a period of personal and familial expansion as Brenner, alongside Jacqueline, adopted two Vietnamese children, Mia and Melody, and made a significant real estate investment by purchasing the 16th century 50-acre Manoir de Creekboeuf in Normandy. On this estate, Brenner indulged in an unusual passion, maintaining a rookery of penguins. Despite his fame as an actor, we can see Brenner was not confined to the world of entertainment. As an avid reader with a diverse intellectual background, he studied philosophy at the Sorbonne and attended ethics classes in Chicago, under the guidance of Dr. Paul Arthur Schilp, a highly respected scholar who founded the Library of Living Philosophers. Schilp described Brenner as possessing one of the most brilliant minds he ever encountered, commending him for being well-versed in politics, economics, literature, music, and history. During this time, Brenner remained actively engaged in humanitarian efforts, taking pride in his involvement with the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees and contributing to campaigns aimed at combating prejudice against the Roma people, commonly known as gypsies. 
As his personal life evolved, he continued to immerse himself in intellectually stimulating pursuits. Yul Brynner, paying meticulous attention and attaining excellence in performance. When Brynner received the script for Westworld, a science fiction thriller by Michael Crichton, he found the thematic exploration of human infantilism in the face of new technology particularly compelling. Approaching his role in the movie with dedication, Brynner portrayed the malfunctioning robot with a steely stare, going to great lengths for authenticity, even wearing silver metallic contact lenses throughout filming. This commitment mirrored his dedication to previous projects, showcasing Brynner's unwavering passion for his craft. Yul Brynner's attention to detail added a robotic intensity to his performances, showcasing his unwavering commitment to bringing depth to his characters. Richard Benjamin, who played the target of Brynner's malfunctioning robot in the futuristic amusement park in Westworld, fondly remembered their time working together. Benjamin praised Brynner as the best and credited him with teaching valuable lessons, including how to fire a gun in a movie without blinking. Brynner, drawing from his extensive experience, shared insights with Benjamin, noting that even the biggest Western stars tended to blink when the gun went off. Benjamin described Brynner as a pretty amazing, larger-than-life person, emphasizing the profound impact the veteran actor had on his co-stars. Westworld proved to be Brynner's last significant movie role, marking the conclusion of an era in his cinematic career. His final appearance on the big screen came in the Italian Western Death Rage in 1976. Despite his remarkable contributions to film, Brynner expressed regret over an unfulfilled dream, making a film about Kemal Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey. However, the ambitious project faced insurmountable challenges, including disagreements about the facts of Ataturk's life. In the aftermath of his illustrious film career, Brynner found himself returning to the role that had defined much of his stage success, Moncut in The King and I. Endless tours and Broadway reruns became a recurring part of his later years. Mary Beth Peel, Brynner's leading lady for the final two years of the touring production, shared a surprising encounter that defied expectations. Contrary to warnings, Brynner greeted her with a warm hug and the words, Welcome to the family, showcasing a more personal and unexpected side to the iconic actor. What Brynner's daughter, Victoria, had to say about her father. Brynner had five children, and they all had something interesting to say about their father. Growing up as the daughter of Yul Brynner and Chilean model Doris Kleiner, Victoria experienced a childhood steeped in glamour and surrounded by iconic figures. Her godmother was her mother's best friend, who was the legendary Audrey Hepburn. Adding to the allure, Yul Brynner ran in circles that included luminaries like Jean Cocteau and Pablo Picasso. Now, as the founder and president of Stardust Brands, a management group fostering connections between luxury brands and creative talent, Victoria continues to move in star-studded circles, blending her legacy with contemporary luxury. Amidst this glittering backdrop, Victoria holds a special place in her heart for The King and I, a production that deeply impacted her due to her father's portrayal of the iconic King Moncut. The emotional resonance of the King's heartbreaking final scene left a lasting impression on her, and she fondly recalls spending countless hours witnessing the performance on Broadway and in London. For Victoria, many cherished memories of her father revolve around his enduring role as the King. Yul Brynner's association with The King and I began in 1951 when he originated the role on Broadway, earning him a Tony. The success continued with an Oscar for the 1956 film adaptation. While Brynner went on to deliver memorable performances in films like The Ten Commandments and The Magnificent Seven, it was the character of The King that he returned to as he agid out of his leading man face. The legacy of Yul Brynner is set to continue with upcoming remakes of films he starred in, namely The Magnificent Seven and Westworld. 
Both projects are slated for release as a feature film and an HBO series, respectively, demonstrating the timeless appeal of Brenner's work. Victoria, reflecting on her father's potential reaction to this revival, believes he would be surprised and likely flattered. Brenner's son, Rocky, also took on the task of writing a biography about his father, titled Yule the Man Who Would Be King, in 1989. The biography, published four years after Yul Brynner's passing at the age of 65, served as a posthumous exploration of the iconic actor's life. It not only shattered certain myths perpetuated by Brynner himself, such as his claimed descent from Roma stock, but also presented a nuanced portrait of a complex individual. Despite Brynner's immense ego, the biography highlighted moments of genuine love between father and son. It delved into the struggles faced by Rock Brenner, Yul's only son, as he grappled with the weight of his father's legacy. Rock Brenner, in a 1991 radio interview, characterized the biography as a study of how a son models himself on his father and, as life progresses, finds the necessity to distance himself. This insight provides a glimpse into the intricacies of their relationship, shedding light on the challenges faced by Rock Brenner in navigating the shadows of his iconic father's persona. Brenner's solemn humility in his last years. In his later years, Yul Brenner's life took a somber turn. He revealed that he started smoking at the age of 12 and eventually became a heavy smoker with a consumption of five packs a day. The repercussions of this habit caught up with him in 1983, the same year he entered his fourth marriage with Kathy Lee, a 24-year-old Malaysian chorus line dancer. Brenner received the devastating diagnosis of throat cancer. Even though he had officially quit smoking in 1971, his promotional photos continued to feature him with a cigarette or cigar, perpetuating an image associated with his earlier years. During his career, Brenner had to take a hiatus from the musical's national tour to undergo radiation therapy. This medical intervention aimed to address health issues likely related to his smoking history. Unfortunately, the radiation therapy had unintended side effects, resulting in damage to his throat. This damage significantly impacted his ability to sing or speak effortlessly. Faced with the gravity of his condition, he turned to Buddhism, finding solace and understanding in the face of his imminent mortality. Reflecting on the gypsy saying that your future is getting shorter, he embraced this newfound awareness. At the age of 65 on October 10, 1985, Yul Brynner succumbed to his battle with cancer. Remarkably, shortly before his death, he completed a triumphant return to Broadway, showcasing his enduring commitment to his craft. One poignant testament to his legacy was a posthumous commercial Brenner recorded for the American Cancer Society, which aired after his passing. In this message from beyond the grave, Brenner emphatically warned against smoking, stating, Now that I'm gone, I tell you, don't smoke, whatever you do. This heartfelt plea proved impactful, credited with inspiring thousands of individuals to quit smoking. In typical Brenner fashion, known for his mysterious personality, he provided various versions of what should be written on his headstone. Among the proposed epitaphs were, I have arrived, and here lies a man who adored children of all varieties. However, in an ironic twist, one of his contract demands that went unfulfilled was the epitaph on his headstone. Today, his remains rest in a churchyard in France, with the only words on the headstone being his name and the dates of his birth and death, underscoring the mystery that Yul Brynner maintained even in his final moments. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to the channel and check out another of our interesting videos before you leave. See you on the other side.